So today we are going to talk about paniculitis, which is lecture number 10 in Dermatopathology for Resident Lecture Series. This is Dr. Singh. So when we look at the fat in normal skin, so here we can see the fat in normal skin. It is divided into these fat lobules. And between the fat lobules, you have this very thin layer of septa. You can see the very thin layer of septa that is dividing the fat lobules. So when there is inflammation that is involving the subcutaneous fat, that is paniculitis. When we talk about paniculitis, it could be either septal or it could be septal and lobular. So septal paniculitis is when the inflammation and the main action is happening in the septa. And when the lobules are involved along with the septa, then it is a lobular paniculitis. So let's first talk about septal paniculitis. So this is the first case, 32 year old female presents with red tendon nodules on the lower legs. So they are present on both legs, red tendon nodules, it's a young female. And when we look at the biopsy, we can see that the septa are quite involved actually. And the lobules, there is a minimal inflammation in the lobules, but it is not quite extensive. So we look at the septa and they are quite thickened and fibrotic compared to the thin layer of septa that we saw in normal skin. And when you go high power, you can see there's a lot of acute and chronic inflammation in the septa. There is a lace-like inflammation going into the lobules, but this is only limited to the outer part of the lobules. It's not extensively involving the entire lobule. And this inflammation is composed of lymphocytes, giant cells, macrophages, and shows these granulomas that are known as myces granulomas. So in septal paniculitis, that in, in the example that we see here, what we see is a very thick and fibrotic septa with chronic inflammation and granulomas. And this is prototype, prototypical lesion of a septal paniculitis that is erythema nodosum. <coughs> so erythema nodosum, <coughs> clinical presentation usually will occur bilaterally over the pretibial surfaces but can also occur at other sites. It is a slow involution, so the, the disease is present for some time. Unilateral variants might exist, but they are not very common. Clinically, they will present with this tender, bruise-like appearance. Usually, there is no ulceration. And the patient may have fever, arthralgia, or malaise. So, so when, you, when you talk about erythema nodosum, there's a lot of uh, things that can actually cause erythema nodosum. But one third of them, are idiopathic where we don't know the cause, what is causing the erythema nodosum. Known, some known reasons that are related to erythema nodosum include infections, mainly streptococcal infections, <clears throat> some drugs, oral contraceptive pills is the most common one, and it's also associated with sarcoidosis and inflammatory bowel disease. So that is the only condition where you have to think of a septal, purely septal paniculitis. All the other ones are either septal and lobular. So when you talk about a septal and lobular paniculitis, the first thing that you need to decide is what kind of inflammation is the predominant cell type. So do we see a lot of neutrophils? Is it predominantly lymphocytic? Are there a lot of eosinophils? Or is it predominantly a granulomatous or a suppurative and granulomatous inflammation? So when we go high power and we see if it is predominantly neutrophilic, then our list of differential diagnoses will include either it could be a pancreatic paniculitis, it could be an infective paniculitis, or it could be alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency associated paniculitis. So here's the first example where we have this 54-year-old male who developed red tendon nodules on the leg, some of which were draining in oily yellow fluid. So these nodules that you see here, and they were draining fluid. So when we look at the biopsy, let's make it straight here. So when we look at the biopsy, the main action again is in the subcutis because the epidermis and the dermis look pretty uninvolved. There's some mild inflammation, but the main action is in the subcutis. So when we go into the subcutis, we see that the lobules and the septa, they have a lot of neutrophilic infiltrate. There's a lot of hemorrhage, but very... <coughs> A striking feature that you see here is this purple color that you see here actually. So this is fat that has gone necrotic. So this is known as saponification of fat. So you can see this purple because in this, uh, in this condition, a lot of enzymes are being released into the fat 
and these enzymes will then cause digestion of the fat and necrosis basically and this is digested fat so this is saponification and this neutrophilic infiltrate along with sap, this saponification and some necrosis is very classic for pancreatic panniculitis so the patient must have some sort of a chronic pancreatitis that has led to release of enzymes in the subcutaneous fat that has really then, then then caused all these changes in the subcutaneous fat tissue when we talk about <coughs> pancreatic panniculitis they usually present with painful red nodules on the leg like we saw in our patient and less commonly on the trunk and the arms they can ulcerate and they can drain a yellow brown fluid because of the saponification of the fat and it is usually a complication of pancreatic disease and you can see here again the image that shows the saponification of the fat the next condition that we talked about for a neutrophilic infiltrate is alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency so again here we can see that the fat there's a lot of some there are areas of necrosis some abscess formation and if you go high power it is predominantly a dense neutrophilic infiltrate so if you see this dense neutrophilic infiltrate uh, you always have to first always have to think of an infective condition also so you have to rule out the in, you have to do all your stains to make sure you are not dealing with some sort of an infective panniculitis but then the clinical history and the clinical pathological correlation then can help you make the diagnosis of alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency associated panniculitis which is a predominantly neutrophilic panniculitis one thing that has been classically described in alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency associated panniculitis which we do not see in this biopsy is there are areas that are completely normal and then there are areas that are complete in the fat that are completely normal and then there will be areas that are densely necrotic and are associated with a almost like an abscess formation of neutrophils actually so if you see the scattered areas that look normal and then you see some areas that show a lot of neutrophilic infiltrate and they also show you some sort of an abscess formation think of alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency and then when you think of it then you're going to to far look for history and then when you, you call up the clinician and then you'll find out that the patient might have some sort of an associated pulmonary disease like emphysema or bronchiectasis there might be some sort of a liver disease like chronic hepatitis cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma and these uh, panniculitis they keep on occurring uh, one like a, and then heal and occur and heal and that history then can make you think of alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency then you look for the enzyme levels and based on that then you can make the diagnosis of alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency associated panniculitis it is always important to look at the phenotype and the genotype because the pizz panniculitis is the more common one and it occurs mostly on the thigh buttock and it can also occur on the proximal limbs usually they present with this deep seated nodules that often break down ulcerate with oily discharge very classically you'll see this oily discharge coming out and they are painful basically and often follows a minor injury and uh, the important thing i like we said genotyping is important because the more severe form where there is complete loss of enzyme they will require replacement therapy but if there is partial loss of the enzyme formation then you can manage it medically actually and then the last one that you need to remember if you see a dense neutrophilic infiltrate besides pancreatic panniculitis and alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency is infective panniculitis so these present with red deep subcutaneous nodules that can ulcerate and drain and they are located mostly on the legs arms and the trunks and when you look at the biopsy again you are going to see a very dense neutrophilic infiltrate in the lobules actually so you see this very dense neutrophilic infiltrate in the lobules so think about infection you do all your stains you do a gram gram stain you do a fungal stain you do the afb you do every all the stains rule out all the infection if you don't see any infection infectious organism you will still recommend that culture should be done and a clinical pathological correlation with the cultures is, is recommended if you see a lot of neutrophils within the subcutis causing a neutrophilic panniculitis uh moving on to the next case this is a 45 year old male with uh, present with tender rash on the lower legs present for 4 years actually so you can see that there is a rash that is present and this is usually on the dorsal on the 
so like erythema nodosum was in the front part of the legs and this is at the back of the calf basically so here we look at the biopsy what do we see here like we know like when we look see when see at this power we know there is the main action is happening in the subcutis actually because there is a lot of inflammation involving the subcutaneous fat so like i said we have to go down and then look at the players actually so who are the players here basically so again we see a lot of neutrophils here basically you can see there's a lot of neutrophils this bile lobe nucleus and all these neutrophils almost forming like an abscess basically and then there's a lot of fibrosis in the septa and there is also a lot of giant cells and macrophages so it's like more of a suppurative and a granulomatous inflammation you can see all these macrophages that are associated with the inflammation so it's not only neutrophils it is a suppurative and granulomatous inflammation so whenever you see a lot of neutrophils one thing that we did not mention in the previous biopsies especially if it is associated with a lot of macrophages you have to go down and look for vasculitis actually so you go down and you look at all these vessels around here so do we see any vasculitis around the vessel so if we look around here let's look at the biopsy and so you go high power and here you can see there's a lot of actual vasculitis so you see a fibrinoid degeneration around the vessel wall you can see there's a lot of ne necrosis that is happening around the fat so there's fat necrosis uh, vasculitis neutrophilic infiltrate suppurative and granulomatous inflammation and lesions present at the back of the legs so then if you see all these conditions then you have to think of erythema induratum actually or nodular vasculitis especially with the vasculitis so this this presence has erythematous tendon nodules or plaques on the posterior lower legs and the calves it is often recurrent usually it's young to middle aged women you might see some ulceration you might not see it and these nodules display overlying crust with rolled erythematous blue tinged borders actually and this lesion will heal over several months with atrophic hyperpigmented scars and previously like in the past this was usually associated with tuberculosis actually so it was originally classified as a tuberculoid and mycobacterial dna in lesions has been detected by pcr actually so if you do you always have to do an afb stain and a fight stain if it is negative you should recommend also a pcr to look for mycobacterial dna current in the current situation this is not a very common association but in the past this was very common so we still need to recommend that you do a pcr for mycobacterial dna to make sure this is not associated with tb actually and uh, in the non tb causes could include infectious example a nocardial infection and some drugs example propyl propyl thiouracil actually now we'll move on to the next one where we see predominantly lymphocytes so now you don't see any lymphocytes you're not seeing a lot of macrophages but predominantly lymphocytes actually so here is an example so when you see lymphocytic lobular panniculitis you have to start thinking of connective tissue disease actually if you see predominantly lymphocytes think of some connective tissue disease so either it could be lupus or it could be dermatomyositis related panniculitis so here is a case which presented with tender indurated nodules on the arm breast buttock and thigh and there were some overlying skin changes so when we look at the biopsy here you can see again it's the main action is happening in the subcutis actually the even the epidermis and the dermis look pretty normal there is some mild perivascular and periadnexal inflammation in the dermis but when we look at the fat there is the main action is happening in the fat so again you go high power and you start looking at the kind of infiltrate that we see here actually so what do we see here we see predominantly a lot of lymphocytes here you can see that these are all lymphocytes and if you look carefully there are also some associated plasma cells actually so it's a lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate that is affecting the lobule there is another plasma cell actually so it's a lymphocytic panniculitis now what are the other features that we see here actually so if we go here let's look at this lobule here you can see like this lobule this very classic feature that is known as hyalinization of the fat so you can see this is almost like hyaline material deposition within the between the fat cells actually and this change is known as hyalinization of the fat lobules so if you see this lymphocytic panniculitis with admixed plasma cells and some of the lymphocytes almost forming like these big nodules like they are they are forming like a limb, like you would see in a lymph node 
So you might even see some big lymph node like nodules and then you see this hyalinization of the fat. This is very classic for lupus profundus actually. So hyalinization of the fat with a lymphocytic infiltrate in the subcutis with associated plasma cells is very classic for lupus profundus. And 50% of cases of lupus will not show any changes in the epidermis. We don't see the vacuolar interface changes and you don't see the perifollicular and the periadnexal infiltrate in the dermis. And 50% might show, but half of the cases are do not show any changes in the epidermis of the dermis. And dermatomyositis related paniculitis is going to show you also similar changes, but there could be associated calcification. So uh, when you talk about lupus associated paniculitis, it is usually proximal and the uh, extremities and the trunk and the face. They usually present with plaques, uh, plaques and they can ulcerate and sometimes calcify, often disfiguring, usually in dermatomyositis and they heal with scarring actually. And uh, one thing that you can sometimes do, whether even when it is like a, just a discoid lupus, you could, many studies have shown that the most of the lymphocytes that are associated with lupus are positive for CD123. I don't know how helpful that is going to be, but you can sometimes use that to confirm your diagnosis of connective tissue disease. And if it is a lupus profundus, it might have a positive lupus band test, which you can do with the immunofluorescence. And now moving on to the last one where you see a lot of granulomatous inflammation. So you see a lot of giant cells, you see a lot of granulomas. So there's a lot of conditions that can cause a granulomatous lobular paniculitis. Some of the common ones that we, you should know are Crohn's disease. Uh, the patient might have some post-steroid paniculitis, calciphylaxis, cold paniculitis, sclerema neonatrum, subcutaneous fat necrosis of the newborn, traumatic fat necrosis and lipodermatosclerosis. So we'll go over some of these, not all of them. So the one of the important ones that you should definitely know is calciphylax because this is sometimes of a medical emergency because the patient can sometimes die. So these usually present with a libido reticularis evolving into painful retiform plaques with central necrosis. And you can see that black scar-like formation, that is the central necrosis. And if you look at the biopsy that you get, it, it is usually like a lot of inflammation within the fat that is composed of giant cells and macrophages. But the classic feature that you can see even at low power is this calcification. So these purple things that you see that are usually scattered around the vessels. Some of the vessels will also show proliferation around. So you will see some of the vessels showing proliferation of the vessel wall. So there's a lot of calcification that you see here actually, which is known as mural calcification. See all this calcification that you see here. And it is usually associated with the vessels, with the small vessels of the deep dermis and the subcutaneous fat. And some of the vessels, if you look carefully, are going to show you some fibrin thrombi within the vessels. And because there is fibrin thrombi within the vessel, there's going to be some fat necrosis that might be seen within the fat lobules basically. But what you want to look for is this calcification. So in this one, it's very obvious. Sometimes it might not be that obvious. You might have to look very carefully to look for these uh, purple, small, sometimes very, very small globules that you see that are in association with the vessel and then there's associated giant cell reaction actually. So you could also do a uh, stain like Vonkasa or alizarine red to sometimes highlight the calcification. So calciphylax is usually associated with renal failure, secondary para, hyperparathyroidism, and they present with this very tender plaques and nodules, most commonly on the buttocks and the breast actually. But this could, this is an important condition to look for when the patient has this black necrotic skin. You want to go back into the fat and look for this calcification. Uh, in subcutaneous fat necrosis of the newborn, these usually present with tender form nodules on the extremities and the risk factors are if the mother has some sort of a perinatal hypothermia, hypoxia, some di sometimes diabetes, preeclampsia and seizures. This is not a life-threatening condition. The patient will usually recover very uh, almost 100%. Uh, biopsy is very classic here that you see here. So you can see there's a paniculitis that is happening in the subcutis. So there's a lot of inflammation and the inflammation is again granulometer. So you can see all these giant cells. 
So all the giant cells, so it's a granulomatous inflammation. The classic feature that you want to look for to make the diagnosis of the subcutaneous fat necrosis in the newborn is this crystals that you see here. So many of these lobules, they show this needle-shaped crystals basically that you can see radiating in the law in the within the fat lobules. And this is what you want to see to make the diagnosis of subcutaneous fat necrosis of the newborn. So a granulomatous reaction pattern within the subcutis with these needle-shaped crystals that you see within the fat cells. You can see them here basically. Now a similar condition can also be seen in post-steroidal paniculitis. So we'll talk about that a lot uh, about that later. But the biopsy will essentially show very something very similar where you see this needle-shaped crystals within the fat cells basically. Sclerema neonatrum, which is another condition that uh, we will talk about in in a, in a, in the in the next few slides, will also present in a similar way with needle shaped crystals. But the one thing that is missing in those is the is the inflammation. So if you only see the uh, the needle shaped crystals and you don't see a lot of inflammation, then you have to think of sclerema neonatrum. And if you see these crystals and you see a lot of inflammation, then either it is subcutaneous fat necrosis of the newborn. Or it is post, uh, uh, or it is a post-steroid paniculitis, and the clinical history can help you differentiate between these conditions. Another one that can show sometimes very similar findings is cold paniculitis. So subcutaneous. So that was about subcutaneous fat necrosis of the newborn. So post-steroidal paniculitis will also show similar findings. This is a rare complication of systemic corticosteroid therapy, and it usually occurs after you suddenly stop the treatment actually and the patient is going to present with this multiple subcutaneous nodules often on the cheek arms and the trunks and the biopsy we already talked about the changes and they will usually heal quickly actually uh, even the cold paniculitis is going to show you similar conditions we talked about sclerema neonatrum which is again going to show you the similar crystals but you are not going to see the inflammatory response now this one is an important diagnosis because this typically occurs in ill premature neonates in the first few days of life and the prognosis is not good actually. So this, these patients tend to die very quickly. So it's an important diagnosis to make basically. Uh, the last one that we are going to talk about is lipodermatosclerosis which is just exaggerated stasis dermatitis. The patient is going to present with tender erythematous nodules that become indurated over time. And as I said, they are most commonly seen with stasis dermatitis. So the biopsy is very classic here where you can see these big holes in the subcutaneous fat. So here, let's get this biopsy here. So you can see there's big holes within the subcutaneous fat. So what has happened is these uh, fat lobules have broken up and they have Coelius basically. So they are like all the they are joining together. So all the walls are gone. So this is one big fat lobule that has coelius into this one big lobule. And you can see that all this mem these membranes have been destroyed actually. So the, the membranes that are separating the fat lobules have been destroyed and this is known as lipomembranous changes because you can see this here. So this is known as lipomembranous changes within the fat lobules basically. So again, a granulometrous inflammation, chronic inflammation. You see this lobules that are some some of them. The fat is again like coalescing into big lobules. Chronic inflammation, giant cells, the lipomembranous changes that we talked about here. You can the very classic feature. Sometimes you can see some calcification, and often when you go to that uh, because this is exa exaggerated stasis dermatitis, you're going to see some stasis changes when you go to the upper part of the papillary pie in the papillary dermis. So you can see this wall, these uh, vessels that have the thick walls and some red cell extravasation. And then the fat is going to show you this chronic granulomatous inflammation, very thick fibrous septa, fat necrosis, uh, lipomembranous changes. And if you see all this, then you are going to make the diagnosis of lipodermatosclerosis. I think that was the last one or so we still have one more. So when, when you see predominantly eosinophils in the subcutis actually. So this one is more of a reactive pattern rather than any specific disease. Uh, here, here this is a case that we got last year, a 49 year old African American woman. He, she presented to the faculty practice with the chief complaint of redness on the right arm for four months. And when we look at the biopsy, it was again a paniculitis. But then if you look at the paniculitis, 
and you go down and you try to see what kind of cells do we see here. It's predominantly a lot of eosinophils actually. So let's go high power. You can see like it's like a big party of eosinophils going here basically. So all these fat lobules are infiltrated with a ton of eosinophils. So this is more of a reaction pattern. We just have to sign the case out as eosinophilic paniculitis. There is no one specific entity that is associated with eosinophilic paniculitis. Uh, there are quite a few entities that are associated. So this could be related to, uh, it could be, so it does not represent a specific disease entity, but more of a histological pattern. And then you have to like do all the pertinent clinical and laboratory investigations to rule out an associated systemic process actually. <clears throat> so you have to rule out like a arthropod bite, bacterial, some bacterial infection, some parasitic infections like Nathostomata or Toxocara canis, the patient might have underlying sarcoidosis. Sometimes we see that with leukocytoclastic vasculitis, sometimes with systemic vasculitis, Well syndrome, deep morphia, Jogren syndrome, even patients of asthma can present with eosinophilic paniculitis. Obviously, insect bites will show a lot of eosinophilic paniculitis and we have seen a few cases of even atopic dermatitis presenting with eosinophilic paniculitis. So you have to do a lot of clinical pathological correlation lab tests to rule out all these con different conditions that can cause eosinophilic paniculitis. I think that was the last slide. So if you want to more get additional in-depth information, images, more clinical images, and you want to see more slides on this topic, you just go to publications.pathpresenter.net and then you will see the resource. This is a free resource, Dermatopathology for Residents. Uh, you go into that uh, resource and you can find a lot of information about every uh, condition that we talked about. Thank you. Have a nice day.